Hey guys, it's Daniel. Welcome back. Prior to the release of Nirvana's official biography, Come As You Are, the writer, Michael Azarad, and Kurt Cobain spent parts of a few days together in a hotel room in Seattle going over the draft of the book. In an article written for The New Yorker in September of 2021, Michael Azarad reflected on what that experience was like. How Kurt Cobain would sometimes stop reading the draft of the book and they would just hang out and talk about music and politics. How sometimes they would just stare out the window at the hotel room and not say anything. And more. Quote, Kurt told me it was illuminating to read about his entire life in chronological order. Very few people have that luxury. Sometimes he'd take a break and we'd stand together by the window overlooking 4th Avenue. We'd talk, eat cookies, or look down to the street where little gangs of homeless kids swarmed around taxis stopped at red lights, trying to wrangle a few bucks out of the cabbies. During those breaks, we didn't speak about the book. Instead, we talked about people we knew in common, music we were listening to, or politics. Sometimes, we'd just stare out the window at the city without saying anything at all. Kurt, being a student of rock history, knew that the story of a rock band is essentially a legend, in the sense that there's some wiggle room in the truth as long as it serves the overall myth. So Kurt was an unreliable narrator of his own story. That's nothing new, it would be hard to name any rock star who wasn't the same. It's up to the journalist to determine what's true and what isn't. But sometimes journalists play along because they're naive, lazy, or overworked. Or they want to be in on the game because it makes for a sensational copy. Whatever the reason, it works to the artist's advantage. I wasn't rigorous about investigating Kurt's mythologizing. For one thing, a tight deadline meant that I just didn't have the time. And for another, he had charmed me, and I unquestionably bought a lot of his tall tales, which turned out well for him. Kurt sat down at the desk and began reading. He smoked constantly and read intently. I kicked back on the bed and worked on an article or played solitaire on my laptop. It was very quiet. The only sounds were the distant gurgling of the hotel's plumbing, a hum whenever the ventilation system switched on and Kurt turning pages. Occasionally, he'd pipe up and say, yeah, yeah, this reads real good. Sometimes he would chuckle at something funny or sigh at something painful. A few times he moaned and asked, ah, do you have to keep that in? I don't remember every passage that bothered him, but one was about a breakdown he had on stage in Rome in the autumn of 1989. Every time Kurt objected, I'd explain why it had to stay in the book and he never pressed the matter. After all, that was our original agreement. To do it any other way would be, as he said in our first conversation about the book, two Guns N' Roses-like. Once in a while, he'd point out a factual error, like correcting the name of the aunt who gave him his first guitar lessons. That first night, he got about a third of the way through the book before he started to fade. It was a lot to absorb. I imagine that he was mostly thinking about how this would play to the authorities who wanted to take his child from him. I also think he may have been looking at it as Nirvana's chief conceptualist, weighing how everything squared with how he wanted the band and himself to be perceived. A little before dawn on the third night, he turned over the last page, planted his palm on the top of the stack as if absorbing its vibrations, and took a long drag on his cigarette. Then, he got up, walked over to me and said, that's the best rock book I've ever read. He hugged me and looked me in the eye, thank you, he said, and then he was gone. My publisher was surprised and immensely relieved that Kurt had only a few minor factual corrections. They were expecting him to raise a fuss, possibly to the point that it could torpedo the whole book, which had already happened with another book about the band. What the publisher overlooked was that the most sensational things were said by Kurt himself. But also, once again, I had dutifully noted down Kurt's key talking points, particularly about being a good, loving parent. That's all he cared about. The rest was window dressing. There's a popular misconception that Kurt was just a guileless junkie, but that's a fallacy. He totally knew what he was doing. 